Now here to speak about individual and corporate leadership is Mr. William Weldon. Listen, I want, to, I want to do two things today. I want to tell you all a little bit about Johnson & Johnson, who we are, what we do. Then I want to talk a little bit about leadership. But the, the thing that I'd like to do most of all is answer your questions. Because I think, uh, you know, I can stand up here and bore you to death for an hour. We can talk about what's on your mind. And, and that's what I'd really prefer to do. So Johnson & Johnson was founded over 100 years ago. It was a small company really looking at antiseptic and, and hospital, hospital supplies and um, has, has moved along a little bit since that time. This is the one that works. Today we're 122, over 122,000 employees. We've got 200 operating companies around the world. And we like to look at it that we, we work with over, or impact over a billion patients every year. And that's people who use our products. Um, we are the largest healthcare company in the world. Use our products or, or actually are affected by people that use it. I had a knee replaced, I was telling a couple people a year ago, and it happens to be one of our knees. But, um, and I, and I say that in all seriousness, when you get to a point where you need to have a procedure like that done, you check them all out and you figure out what you think is the best one. I do feel that ours was the best. And it's truly been a, a life-changing event for me because I can now sleep, I can walk, I can do things that I couldn't do. And it was an old athletic injury that they had to, had to deal with. But it, it does change your life and it changes the life. My wife especially appreciates it. I'm sure my children appreciate it. My grandson says I now have a bionic knee and I can kick him and hit him and do the things that we like to do together. <laughs> but, but we can have a good time. So it does, it really does. We do impact people's lives. We do look at it as we care for the world one person at a time. And that's really important to us because you can look at all the infirmities around the world. We were talking about the the program earlier that we, you know, a lot of the work we do in Africa and the program that uh, UCLA runs that we're privileged to be a part of. But every, every person is different and every person has to be looked at differently and we try and make sure that we understand the impacts we have on people every place around the world, but it is truly one person at a time and it's whether you use our Neutrogena or Aveeno products or our Johnson's Baby products or you put a knee into somebody or a stent in someone's heart or in their, in their vessels. It impacts each person, and each person is different, and you have to think about that as, as you do these things. The corporation, as I said a minute ago, is it's about $60 billion. It's the largest healthcare company in the world, but we break our businesses really into three separate component parts, our pharmaceutical business being our largest portion of that. And if you took it just by itself, it's probably, uh, probably about the sixth largest pharmaceutical company in the world, probably the second largest as a subset of that biotechnology company in the world. If you look at our consumer products company, which is about, I think it's about, well, it's about 24% of our business <clears throat> is made up of, of numerous companies. I mentioned Neutrogena, Vino, Tylenol, Listerine. We acquired Pfizer Consumer Healthcare earlier. Well, actually, we finalized the deal at the end of last year. And we have the largest OTC healthcare company in the world, if you just looked at that. And then our medical device business, which encompasses everything from sutures with Ethicon to endoscopic products we talked about, to stents, to knee replacements, um, to our cardiovascular business, is the largest single um, medical device and diagnostics company in the world. And we look at them as three separate businesses and three separate units. But when you put them all together, we, we think we have a really extraordinary organization because most healthcare companies are either a pharmaceutical business or a medical device business or maybe a consumer business. By having the three of them, we have technologies, we have the ability to get close to the patients and the people that we work with in the marketplace. And over time, you're gonna see convergence of technologies. So you're gonna see the diagnostics business, and we're starting to see it now, being able to look at genetic markers who are going to identify patients who are responders or no responders to pharmaceutical products or have side effects or don't have side effects. So as we do our clinical trials today, we look at genetic markers and we try and identify the patients that will respond to, pro to, to the pharmaceutical products. Same thing with our Cortis, with the Cypher stent that our Cortis company has. It was the first drug eluting stent put on the marketplace. Prior to that, we had the first stent put on the marketplace. But it was a coming together of our engineers and our medical device businesses and our pharmaceutical scientists were able to put 
a, a rejection drug called sirolimus on a stent to improve the, the impact we have on people's lives who have blockages or need stents to, to help them. So there's a convergence of all of these skills and technologies that allows us to be able to identify needs of patients and be able to work closely with those patients. We also think that the diversity of our business and the distribution of our business is really important. Where you have pharmaceutical products and you have medical device and diagnostics, which are much more volatile businesses, and pharmaceutical products very much driven off of patent expirations. You have your consumer business, which to me I always say is the, is the backbone of the business. It continues to move. It's like an annuity that keeps paying back as long as you treat it well and invest in it. And that was one of the reasons why we bought Pfizer Consumer Healthcare was to strengthen our consumer business, to bring new technologies into place. I think we're, we're the category leader, if you look at Walmart vernacular, in 22 categories now because of the uh, coming together of our business and the Pfizer Consumer Healthcare business. The one thing that when you talk about leadership uh, that to me is, and in many areas is viewed as one of the most extraordinary business roadmaps or documents of how to do business that was ever written, and it's called, and it is our credo. And our credo really says you have four responsibilities. The first is to the, the people that use your products, and that's patients, consumers, whoever it may be, the mothers or fathers that use your products. The second are to your employees. You have to be committed to your employees and be, make sure that they are a high priority. The third is to the communities in which we live and work, and that deals with our philanthropy. And the fourth is to the stockholder. And that document was written when J&J became a public company over 60 years ago. And at that time, there was only one shareholder, and that was Robert Wood Johnson, General Robert Wood Johnson, who wrote this document. And he put himself forth. And it's been a, it's been a principle that we've lived by, and we challenge this all the time. We have credo challenge sessions. J&J, for the last uh, eight years, has been the number one or new, two most respected companies in the world. Uh, and that is because of this document and the commitment we have to the people that use our products first and foremost. And when you think about, I'm sure you all, you may study the Tylenol story. There's a there's hundred stories in J&J that even had more financial impacts, greater financial impacts than Tylenol did in the, uh, I guess it was the 80s when we had the poisoning cases and Jim Burke basically took all the Tylenol off the market and then put it back on the market. That was done at a huge cost to J&J, &J, not knowing what would happen to the market we were in with Tylenol, but making sure we protected the integrity of patients and not worried about the stockholder. And we worried about it. We knew it was an issue. We knew it was a challenge, but it was the right thing to do. We had another product probably about four or five years ago in our pharmaceutical business, a product called um, Perpulsive, which was over a billion dollars in sales, very high gross profit. And we took the product off the market, completely off the market, because there were drug interactions and other things that we felt we could not protect the integrity of the patient. But there were, there were large numbers of patients that needed this product. So what we did with it was we worked with the government to set up a, an access program where we paid 100% of the bill for anybody that needed the product, made sure they had it, but didn't want to compromise patients who were not looked at in the appropriate way to be using the product. So I think it really does talk about the ethical values that are so critically important for leaders today in business. We can all talk about the, the, the challenges that we've had that put Sarbanes-Oxley and other things into place. But I think you have to be driven by, by your values and make your decisions based upon those values and your beliefs. And this really is, we talk about it as, as the fabric that holds J&J &J together. We're known as a decentralized organization, the, probably the best example of a decentralized organization. We have 200 men and women around the world that run our businesses, and this document sets our priorities for us. And it's the thing that allows me to sleep well at night and allows other people to sleep well at night knowing that we're, we all have the same priorities. We also work under strategic principles, and the strategic principles we have are basically the shared values embodied in our credo, and that's the foundation of everything. But also being broadly based in human health care, I talked about the, the three business segments we work in, and we work in those three segments, as I said, because we feel we can impact people's lives and that the technologies will all converge over time and it will allow us to give better products to patients. A decentralized approach to management, it truly is the men and women that run our businesses, that are close to the customer, that work in the countries, that know the products, know the people, and run the businesses so well. And it allows us to avoid the laws of big numbers. 
I was at an investor relations meeting the other day and someone said, aren't you all worried about being $60 billion? And I said, we're really not because you can look at these small, these, these 200 business units or companies being run by those people as the ones that are in the markets, close to the customer, dealing with those issues. We're not a $60 billion company. We are much smaller companies that make up the whole of the $60 billion. So we can continue to move most of these forward. Some will backslide, some will re remain the same. But it's not like pushing this huge boulder up a hill. It's like pushing grains of sand up a hill, which become much easier. And we manage for the long term. Um, we continue to manage for the long term. Recently, we made a decision about a month ago to eliminate about four or 5,000 jobs within Johnson & Johnson to consolidate some businesses because of some of the short-term pressures we have. And we did that exclusively to ensure that we had the resources to invest in the extraordinary pipeline we have of new products coming and to continue to keep our eyesight and our eyes set on the, on the future of the business and managing for the long term. We also very strongly subscribe to the second tenet of our credo, which is about our, our employees. Even though we had to let people go, we treated them with the dignity and respect. We made sure that we were trying to treat them properly, and we made sure that we had adequate outplacement to try and help them find other jobs. We have a leadership profile that you all can see up here that is something when people come to work at Johnson & Johnson we talk about, and it goes through about 12 things that are very important to us. Performance is one of them, the values embodied in our credo, and we expose every leader that comes into J&J &J to this. Uh, it, it talks about being able to look at a high level, work at a high level, and know when you need to insert yourself into a problem situation, but to allow the people that work for you to be able to assert themselves and to, and to run their businesses, and we think it's very important. And you can see many of the things that are up here. You can go on, online and access it, but, but it really does deal with um, being self-aware, understanding who you are and what your role is, um, making sure you're, you're knowledgeable, you're inquisitive, you have a sense of urgency. A lot of those things that are very important to any leader. I'll give you a couple of my thoughts on leadership. This is, if you haven't had an opportunity to read the book um, True North by Bill George, um, he, it's a very interesting book about leadership and I think it's a very good book. But this is a quote out of that book and it really says that you know, you, you, the challenge is to inspire people. Uh, one of the really important things is inspire people, develop people, and create change through those people because the one thing that is constant in the world today is change. But you really become a leader when you realize you're working for other people and you're not working for yourself. That's when people really respond to you, when you are trying to work for others. And that to me is one of the most important things about leadership is to make sure that we are committing ourselves to the people that we do business with, the people that work for me. I work as hard for, if not harder, than they work for me, and they should expect that of me. And they learn to respect people through that. You, you earn, to me, leadership is something that is earned, and it's earned every day. It's not being a good manager. We can all read P&Ls. We can all deal with that. But it's how do you treat others, and how do you work with others, how do you inspire others, and how do you get, I always say, the the leaders in the organization may be the people working on the manufacturing line, but they're the people you'll walk through a wall for. You'll commit yourself to those people. It, it's also really important today that people have courage. I think leaders have to have courage, and they have to see things as they are. In healthcare today, there's a lot of challenges. And if we close our eyes to them or look through at the world through rose-colored glasses, we'll never be able to address those challenges. And it's part of our responsibility to change those things. We work very hard to change the external environment that is really putting challenges on healthcare. To look at HIV in Africa, to look at some of the pandemics around the world, to make sure that we are pricing our products in a way that allows people to have access and affordability. Sometimes you're the lone voice in the woods, but you have to have the courage to stand up and look at things and make sure that you're making decisions that are important to the people that you work for. I think I can't say more about the ethical base, and that's why I say this book, True North, is a very interesting book because it does talk about what is your true north? You know, are you going to compromise things? Are you going to cut corners? I can guarantee you that the people that you work with, and I'm talking about customers, when you get out in the business world, respect people who have uncompromised standards. Once you start compromising your standards, and once you start basing things in ways that are trying to cut corners or do things that maybe are okay, you continue to do them. 
So you need to make sure that when you make a decision, it may not be the most popular decision, it may not be the easiest decision, but you want to make sure you base it and drive it off of what is right. You live your world, and I'll talk about this in a minute, more in the gray zone. The black and, the black and white's easy. Legal and illegal is easy. But most of your life in the business community will be spent in the gray zone. And, that's, and that deals with ethics and morals and values. And why do you make a decision and how do you make a decision and how will it be reviewed and how will it be viewed after it's made and how will it impact you and others. And again, I talked a lot about this already. You, you, as a leader, you have to inspire people. You have to set a vision and then you have to inspire people to meet that vision. If people won't follow you, it's not going to work. I know at Johnson & Johnson, we look very much at the people that go into the leadership roles as to if there's a crisis, will the people in the organization follow those individuals? If they won't, we don't want them. They could be great managers. They could be great people. They could have great values and ethics. But if they can't inspire people to follow them, then they really can't lead. They could be great managers and do great jobs within the organization. But they're never going to be leaders in the organization. And this I said earlier, you, when you really do realize you're a leader is when you, have, you realize you're working for others. There's a, there's a, a, a switch that does, does click over and you realize that your commitment is to the people that work for you and the people that you're working for as much as them working for you. A couple, a couple comments here to just keep in mind as you begin your journey to wherever you're going to be going over time. Um, there's lots of opportunities to lead. I, I mentioned the uh, the person who's a leader on our manufacturing line, the people who comes up with new ideas that mentor new people. There's leaders all throughout the organization. It's not a title or a position. It's a responsibility that someone assumes that allows them to lead. And it can be any place in the organization. As I said, it's not, it's not a title or a position. The time of crisis really defines leadership. And it's really interesting. During the good times, it's very difficult to manage. Because everybody wants to spend more money, everybody wants to add headcount, everybody wants to do a lot of things, and you have to say no. Because if you don't say no, when difficult times come, you have to reverse all of those decisions. But it really is going back to one of the slides I had up earlier. When you look at a situation as it really is, sometimes you have to make very, very difficult decisions. When there's a crisis out there, you have to make difficult decisions. Jim Burke made extraordinary decisions during the Tylenol crisis. You have to face into them, you have to have the courage to make them, and you have to make them. But, but those are the important times. And it's also important when you make those decisions that the people in the organization will rally behind them, even if it has an adverse impact on them. People understand that tough decisions have to be made. It's how you deal with them that becomes important and how people lead during the, lead, will, will follow the leader during the crisis. As I said before, you'll spend a lot of time in gray area. And black and white's easy. Legal and illegal is easy. The rest of it's really tough. And we do sessions with our leadership teams all the time around our credo and what we call ethical decision making. And it's, you know, it's, again, it's about 80 to 90 percent of your life you're going to live here and you're going to have to ask yourself really tough questions. The answer is sometimes not as important as how you get there and why you made the decision and being able to, as we say in the next one, you know, given the newspaper test or the family test, if someone wrote about this decision in the newspaper, would you be proud of it? Would you be able to explain it to your loved ones, your, your family? Would you be able to stand up and feel good about it or not? If the answer is or not, you need to think it through. You need to get people around you who are confidants who you can talk to and work with that will help you make decisions. In today's world, it's not, um, it's not one person being autocratic saying this is the way it is. It's a group of people that help you realize how to do things. And it's not what you do many times, it's how you do it. The what is easy, it's how you do it that becomes really critically important. So I think um, those are pretty much some of my thoughts on, uh, on leadership. Now I'd like to turn it over to you all to uh, ask me any questions. I'll try and answer them. And if I can't, maybe you all have better answers than I do. I'm not sure. But if anybody has any questions, otherwise I'll be back to New York quickly. <laughs> I know there's one over here. The uh, Pfizer consumer acquisition was a very large acquisition. What was the greatest challenge for you as kind of the, the leader of the organization and the organization generally? And was it the same challenge that you thought that you were going to face when 
the deal was being negotiated and the first thought process started on whether or not it would make sense. Yeah, I, you know, it, what's interesting about the Pfizer Consumer Healthcare Acquisition is about a year before that, we were um, in the process of doing another acquisition. That was a company called Guidant, which is in the, the um, cardiovascular area. And we had a deal done with Guidant. It was all done. Some, some things came up. And if you look at Sally May today, they're talking about Max, which are um, events that you had no control over that changed values. With Guidant, a Mac came up. And they had some regulatory issues and some challenges. And we told them that we were going to renegotiate the deal. And we did. And we renegotiated it about $14 a share down from where it had been. At that point, another company, Boston Scientific, jumped in. And we got into somewhat of a bidding war. And the one thing that whenever you get into acquisitions and things like that, I'll give you one piece of advice you should always keep with you. Before you get into the heat of the battle and the media makes it an athletic event of who's going to win and who's going to lose, make sure you know what you're willing to pay for that, act, for that asset. You want to make sure you're going to deliver value to your shareholders or to your enterprise or whatever you're dealing with. We opted out. Boston Scientific ended up buying the company. And I get asked all the time, are you sorry you lost it? And I said, yes, but not at the price we lost it at. And it is now, next to the Time Warner deal, looked at as the worst deal that was ever done because of the price they paid for it. But I still think, you know, I would love to be in the CRM business, and it would have been a great acquisition or, or, you know, asset if we had it done at the right price. Fast forward less than a year, and Pfizer decides they're going to sell their consumer health care business. Um, ourselves and GlaxoSmithKline were the two largest uh, consumer health care businesses in the world, and we looked at the assets that were there, and we decided we would buy them. So there were a lot of companies involved, and we got into the, the bidding and, and everything else that went on. And we ended up acquiring it for, I think it was $16.6 .6 billion. And a lot of people said, oh, that was just a rebound off of Guidon, and geez, you, you, know, you paid too much for it and everything else. And my answer to that is, no, we had a much higher price we would have paid for it if we needed to because we feel the assets were really good. But, but during every acquisition that you go into, you, 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 know, you look at the, um, the negotiations, which are always interesting, and they always get blown up in the media. Uh, I think it was pretty smooth, actually, the way this, this transpired. We had, no, we had no thoughts of buying this, comp this, this a asset, except it became an auction. They wanted to get rid of it, and they had some extraordinary brands. You know, you look at Listerine, you look at Visine, you look at Lubriderm, um, you look at uh, Zyrtec, Nicorette. They had extraordinary assets and really iconic brands, so we decided to buy it. We thought we would have run into much greater problems and issues during the integration phase, which is now almost a year later, because you had a company that was three and a half billion, another one 10 billion coming together, the two uh, component parts. And I'll tell you, I can't, I say this all the time, I'm truly amazed. Have we had hiccups, bumps in the roads, challenges, especially where you have joint ventures outside the United States? Absolutely. But it has been so smooth. And actually, the surprises we found have actually been positive to the point, we've told the street this, that we will be actually at a break-even or accretive in the business a year ahead of schedule. So we'll be there in 2009 as opposed to 2010. The other thing we found is the, is the acceptance we've had because of the size now and the critical mass that we have going in to deal with a Carrefour's or a Walmart's or some of these organizations. So there, there, you know, there's always the negotiations where Everybody's trying to get more for it, and we're trying to get it for less, and you do all that. But, you know, that's kind of standard. But there were no real surprises. And I'd say um, the, only, the, the biggest surprise has been how truly well these two businesses have melded together and have really come together and the, and the commitment that the people have made to be able to make it work out pretty well. Uh, one of the things that we do do, which I think is when you look at acquisitions, we've got about 12 parameters uh, that we look at, um, one of which is culture. And we'll walk away from an organization that we feel does not have a compatible culture and does things differently than we do. The thing I think that made this so smooth is that these people had some really good values. And, and lots of companies have good values, but they may, they may not mesh together with ours. And, um, you know, we do a lot of things that we, we're not proud of either. Earlier this year, we turned ourselves into the, gov the DOJ with foreign corruption. Um, so, you know, I don't want to stand up here and say our credo and what we do is perfect because it's far from perfect. Um, 
but we try and strive to do things well. But I think the, the values and the beliefs of the people really came together very well. Other questions? There's a couple over here, somebody over there, somebody in the back. Uh, you mentioned earlier about Cypher and how um, that was really a marriage of uh, your medical, medical device portion and your pharmaceuticals. Can you comment about what aspects of, in general, like leadership that allows for disparate teams to work together in collaboration like that? Yeah, it's one of the biggest challenges we have because we've grown up in an environment that um, uh, has, has really looked at the entrepreneur, if you want to call it, or the entrepreneur, and in the three business segments that have not been so closely aligned, and we're trying to figure out how do we get convergence, as we call it, better. As a matter of fact, three days next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're bringing our senior leadership together to look at that. But what we try and do is we try and set up forums where, where people who are working in diabetes, for example, or cancer, from the different groups all come together. So this was cardiovasculars, and it was a large meeting of our research scientists who were involved in cardiovasculars uh, that got together, and there were just there was a scientist from our farm group and an engineer, and they, they were at this meeting, got together afterwards and said, isn't this a great idea? Wouldn't it work? Let's look at it. And so we started the research going down, down that path. Then we had to get the manufacturing people who know the, the FDA requirements on the farm side and the, and the medical device side to get together to, to try and work that out. And that was probably one of the biggest challenges that we did a less than good job at. Um, but as I said, we could have done a much better job, but thank God we did it. It was a multi-billion dollar product, the most successful medical device product ever launched, and all those wonderful things we can say, and we could have done a lot better. So the next thing we have to do is figure out how do we get it better. But we try and set up a environments where people who have common interests get together, and they're able to share ideas, posters, and, and different discussions, and then they look at, how do we do that? Uh, I'll give you an example. Right now, we're looking at diabetes. You know, if we don't control diabetes in the world today, health, the cost of healthcare today will be, you know, insignificant compared to what it's going to be in 20 years. And we get people from, you know, we have a product called Splenda, our nutritionals business, which very good for diabetics. Our uh, um, surgery groups where we have bypass for morbid obesity and we have lap bands. We're working on lap bands for morbid obesity. We have um, a life scan, which is, does blue coast monitoring and, and has pumps for insulin. Our pharmaceutical people who are looking at things. And, and then we have a program at J&J &J called Live for Life where we look at wellness. Where we're able to try and help our employees live healthier lifestyles. And with diabetes, there's nothing more important than, than prevention. And how do we look at this continuum of diabetes care and put all of these together and look at a diabetic and help the diabetic? From the beginning to, we have a company called Vistacon, which is contact lenses and involved in, in uh, ophthalmology. And if you look at amputation, you look at cardiovascular events, you look at eye events, all of these are outcomes of the diabetic patient who's not well treated. So we're trying to work at this end to bring prevention, and we know that, we'll, that there's still people that are going to need the other side of it. And it's another area where we're trying to get our people together to work together to look at this whole continuum and to bring, bring better health care, better treatments to patients. Somebody back here. I know there's a few people over here, too. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for being here. This is my pleasure. Great to speak with you. Uh, my question pertains to innovation. Um, I'm interested to hear how, with your 20 different companies, you guys balance innovation, whether it's organic versus acquisitions like the Pfizer uh, acquisition, and then also Along those lines, you mentioned your pipeline. If there are any products in particular we should be looking for that you're most excited about. Yeah, I, you know, I think innovation is a challenge for all of us. And I think if you look at the pharmaceutical side of the industry, uh, there's been a, a um, you know, there's been a drying up of products approved, and they haven't uh, haven't done very well. So I think I think all you can do is create an, an environment for innovation internally. So we have, we spend seven billion dollars internally a year on our R&D and most of that is in pharmaceuticals, about five billion of it's in pharma and the others in medical devices and diagnostics. And we try and look at how do we innovate in those areas? How do we invest in new technologies that really um, provide platforms? How do we look at, you know, the, the cascading of, the, of events that allow you to look at different diseases and how do you impact those? And we try and, and 
and um, innovate early on in those areas. And then we try and get those products to market. And we do that both in biotech and pharmaceuticals. We also do it in, in medical devices, whether it's in our suture business or our um, orthopedic business or our cardiovascular business. And we also do it in, in um, the consumer business. So last year we launched about 400 new products in our consumer business. And, it's, and you know, it's staggering. The numbers surprise me when you look at a Neutrogena or an Aveeno or a Johnson's Baby or a Tylenol. But, but there's about 30 of those that are really important. So to innovate, we bring science and introduce it into our consumer business, which allows us to look at copper for inclusion in um, skin care in the Neutrogena business. Um, we bring dermatologists to work in those areas. We try and set up a climate to allow these things to happen, and that's, and that's standard for many companies. The other thing we do is we have JJDC, which is the development corp, which invests in funds, which invests in startup companies. We take seats on privately held companies. But they also take, we have a group of people there, and if there's an innovative idea that someone has in the organization that is not really fitting into any of our businesses, they can write a business plan and submit it to a group of us that will review this plan. If we like it, we look at the funding, we set up milestones, and we put together a group of people and fund it. For example, we have, a, we have a project right now on stem cells and vermacular degeneration that we're working on and, and looking at that. We have another one in stem cells for diabetes. Um, we had another one which was a delivery technology out of a company we acquired years ago um, which uh, delivers vaccines. We brought that to the point that we felt it should go to. Didn't look like it was going to fit into our businesses. We got together with a bunch of venture people and spun it out. We had a, a dermatology company um, called Barrier Pharmaceuticals today, which was the same thing. We looked at it, a lot of assets we put into it. Didn't look like it was going to become anything. We got together with venture people and spun it out. So we have all different ways that we look at innovation. We also don't just look at innovation as product innovation. We look at it as how do you go to market? How do you deal with, um, we, we did a program in the UK last, earlier this year, I guess it was. We have a product called Velcade for multiple myeloma. And there's a governing body in the UK called NICE, which looks at, which really determines whether the UK government should, re should invest and, and pay for pharmaceutical products. And they looked at Velcade and they weren't sure, so we made an, ad an agreement with them that they can use the product. If patients don't respond, we'll bear the expense. If patients respond, they pay for it. So we're going at risk with the UK government for them to treat multiple myeloma patients with this product. So innovation is not just in products. It's in ways you can go to market, it's in distribution, it's in marketing, it's in finance, it's in all kinds of different things. So we look at lots of different ways to do innovation. But on the product side, I think the internal ventures is something that really sets us apart. And JJDC and, and COSAT, which are our Office of Science of Technology. But then the other ones have the normal disciplines. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about the changing um, health insurance environment and how it's affecting the company and what you can do to uh, lead us through that change? Yeah, I think it's one of the challenges we have, whether it's here in the United States or any place else, is the cost of health care and how do, we, how do we deal with it. I think you can look at you know, Hillary's program or Barack's program or, or anyone else's program, and, and, they, and everybody's got a program today. But I think the real challenge is going to be to get, and I work on a group at the Institute of Medicine, the IOM in Washington, a, a commission that's looking at evidence-based medicine. And what we're trying to do is figure out how do we get really good information and supply it to consumers and physicians and others, healthcare providers who make choices. But I think we have to all sit around a table, and that's what we're doing there, to try and figure out, you know, how do we, how do we address this cost of healthcare, and how do we make sure people make good decisions? We're working right now on, in, in, and this isn't we're working on personalized medicine today, which allows us, again, to look at responders, non-responders. If you look at people who don't respond, it's a high percentage. If you could eliminate those through genetic testing and other things, we can, either, we can hopefully reduce the cost of health care. I think the other thing that, that has to be done from a manufacturer's side, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that we have to help shape this external environment. And you have to look at access and affordability. We talk about 47 million uninsured in the U.S., of that, about 50% make over $75,000 a year, and they've just opted not to take insurance. The others, we have a responsibility to help them get good health care. 
And the industry, J&J &J and the industry in the, on medical devices and pharmaceuticals have programs where if you're an indigent patient, we'll give you the drugs for free. All you have to do is tell us. And you have to go and submit that. And I think the industry spends well over billions annually in doing and giving free health care to people who need it. But I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is rewarding true innovation, you know, like the 15th proton pump inhibitor for, for, for GERD or gastric reflux is not worth the same as a cure for cancer. So we have to figure out how do we do that. I think the other thing we have to do, there's a lot going on right now in this critical path analysis, reducing the cost of bringing a drug to market. If you look at the cost of a drug today to get it to market, it's about a billion dollars all in. Um, if you went to a critical path where you could actually start to use some of the new chip technology and other things to eliminate products that have cardiovascular liver toxicity and other things, you could probably, instead of doing three and 4,000 patients in a clinical study, you could do maybe 500. That would bring the cost way down. But we all have to be responsible um, as, a, as an industry in making sure that we do gain this access. I think, you know, and, and it's a belief we all have, is that anybody that needs our products anywhere in the world needs them, should get them. We came out with a product last year for HIV AIDS, which was, was a huge breakthrough. Um, it's, it's effective in 97% of the resistant strains of, of the HIV virus. And when we came out with it, we said we will supply it at an affordable price to sub-Saharan Africa, whatever that means, whether we negotiate with an with a company in India or a company in Africa who can manufacture and supply it, whether we give it away. Um, I'm opposed to giving things away because I don't think people place value on them, but at, at a very low price, we are committed to making sure people get these products, and they need them. We are right now developing a knee uh, that will, will, will bring the same type of relief to somebody in Asia who doesn't have the resources I have to have the knee that I have in me. That's a responsibility we have. So I think we have to work with the government, we have to work with the insurance companies, we, as suppliers, with the medical community, with the patient activist groups, we all have to work together. And I think only through that are we going to find something that's going to work for everybody. Okay? You've got the mic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, could you share that uh, the, the best and the worst decision you have ever made, something specific in your either personal and career life? And then second question is that since we are in the Anderson, so you can provide us with some cosmetic tips for the people who want to get the position in the Anderson uh, and the J and J. Could could you? I'm sorry, I didn't quite so understand. The first question is that I want to you share with us that the, the best and the worst decision you have ever made. Oh sure. In e either either. <laughs> Just don't tell you your best decision is to join the JNJ, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing something, um, some special thing. And the second question is that, since we are in the Anderson, so I'll be to provide us some customized tips for the people who want to get the position in the JNJ. Some, some ideas about people who want to go to join JNJ? Yeah, yeah, some customized tips. Customized. Okay, the first one, some bad decisions I've made. Gosh, there's so many, there's so many bad decisions I've made, and I try and tell our people that all the time because it's important. You know, if, if you don't make any bad decisions, you're not taking enough risks. I think, the, I think the worst decisions I've made and the best decisions I've made have been around people. You know, to me, people drive everything. You guys will drive the future. The people in this room are going to be the future, you know, and you're going to be the future leaders of the world. And if you do good things, it's going to be good, and if you don't, it's not going to be so good. Um, so, so I do believe, and even in our research labs and every place else, it's the people that discover these things and do things. So the good decisions I've made have been around people. The bad decisions I've made have been around people. I've also made a lot of foolish decisions. I've made some bad acquisitions. Now, I could go down and tell you, tell you the bad acquisitions. The thing to me that's always important is when you make bad choices, you rectify them quickly. You don't let them sit out there and fester and become a problem. You, you face into them and address them. And there's a fellow I put on the executive committee of Johnson & Johnson years ago um, who in six months I knew he was not going to work out. And, and we, we had a, I helped him as best I could. I got him consultants to help him. We worked together and we sat down one day and right before we sat down he'd actually called HR and said I know I'm not making it because we would had enough discussions. And we're still good friends and he's outside doing a job that he's much better equipped for 
But the, the other people on the executive of J, committee of J&J &J came and said, Bill, you can't do this. We've never let anybody go from the executive committee. I said, well, that's not a reason not to do it. You know, it was a bad decision. It was a bad, it was not, it was a bad choice I made. Good person, wonderful person, just the skills weren't right. And, and he's very successful today, and we still maintain a good relationship, and he actually brings companies to us. Um, tips, tips about J&J. &J. You know, I, I, I just think um, every opportunity, and I said it about leaders up here, you should take advantage of every opportunity you're given. Um, you know, whatever it may be, how small it may seem or how large it may seem, you take advantage of it. Um, you treat people properly. You know, we have a thing in our credo that says dignity and respect. People respect you if you make the tough decisions. We just, as I said, we laid off, we're, we're in the process of laying off about 5,000 people, four to 5,000 people. And we notified one of the groups that we were going to close down the facility. And we sent a letter out to the employees telling them the night before we told the street, the financial community. And I did a press conference the next day, and the, and the financial community said, well, where is it going to happen? Who's it going to happen to? And what's going on? And I said, I'm not going to tell you because we haven't told the people who are involved. We're telling them today. And, and what, what happened was the people that were notified they were going to lose their jobs said, we appreciated you being honest with us. We appreciated hearing from you. And we will stand up and help you with the other people who have to be laid out, off because of the way we're doing it. So, I, I, you know, and it's kind of just, you know, again, make sure you understand why you're doing something. You can pass that red face test or that newspaper test or the family test. Um, commit yourself to it and then do it in the appropriate way, whatever it is, and take advantage of every opportunity. Whether you want to work at J&J &J or you want to work you know, in the financial community or, or whatever, wherever you want to go or whatever you want to do, just make sure that you're, you're doing it for the right reasons and that you're committed to what you're doing. You all have microphones, so wherever, wherever you're going. Yeah, um, as when you mentioned, oh, I'm Kelly. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned your principles, I think one thing really impressive is sort of your long-term vision and your sort of long-term strategy. But you're a, for good or for bad, you're a public company that has to report earnings every mm -hmm. quarter, mm -hmm. and Wall Street's sort of notoriously fickle. And most right. mutual funds, they have huge turnover. How do you convince? those institutional investors and your board of directors to, to think about the long term and not ignore the fact that maybe one penny was wrong one quarter? Well, you know, the, the streets are non-forgiving. I mean, they really are. You know, you, uh, you can debate whether you ought to give guidance or not. We give one-year guidance. Um, and, you know, we J, J is notorious for, you know, under-committing and over-delivering, even during tough times. Um, we're, we're off about 2% on stock price this year, and it's for a myriad of reasons. On, you know, there's, there's some events that have gone on in healthcare with some of our products that have, have created some real challenges. But I, I think, you know, people have to understand what we do and why we do it and how it's, you know, it's withstood the test of times. You can go back and look at the Fortune 100 over the last 20 years. I think there's only, you know, 20 companies that are still there. We're one of them. Um, you know, there's only, there's only a handful, less than 10 companies, who have over-delivered the average in both profits and income over that period of time. We're one of them. Um, and, you know, we've had our ups and downs. When Hillary, you know, when Bill was elected and Hillary did her health care thing, I mean, our stock fell down tremendously, you know, and it came back. When we did the Tylenol thing, we lost value, it came back. Um, you, have to, you have to stand by your principles, and that's why I said earlier, Customers respect people who, who do not compromise their standards. And, you know, the, the, the comment that was made earlier, a share of stock sold when we became public at $37 a share is worth now $950,000 if you've reinvested your dividends. Um, that's the long term. Uh, we, we, the actions we just took, and, and I went on a, and talked to all the people in the street about this, the actions we took a month, six weeks ago, to reduce these costs, we'll deliver $1.6 billion, one, between $1.3 and $1.6 billion of expense reduction in 2008. We have, a, we have $7 billion of products going off patent in the next two years. We have a pipeline, and I didn't address some of the questions you asked earlier about the, the ones I'm really excited about. There's a whole bunch of them. But we have a pipeline that we have addressed the short-term pressures on the business, but we're not taking one penny away from the investment we have in the pipeline in the long term. 
And people know that about J&J. &J. They just know it. And um, that's the way we work. I, I, I think I might have said either here or downstairs, I get asked all the time, are there things you could do to improve the value, the price of the stock? And the answer is yes. The second question is, am I willing to do those things? And the answer is no. We talked about the half a billion dollars plus that we give to in philanthropy every year. If I wanted to increase the bottom line by half a billion dollars, I could just stop doing philanthropy. We're not going to do that. You know, we're just not going to do that when we're under pressure. We're going to continue to do what we believe in, and that's what's so important for everybody to have your values, to know what's important to you, and then stick with them. And we are, you know, the strategic principles, we debate all the time. De decentralization, broadly based, you know, and managing for the long term. We challenge those all the time, but they seem to hold up. So people know that those are the things we're going to do, and people can have confidence that we're going to deliver over. You know, and the street asked me, won't you give us guidance beyond one year? Give us three years, give us five years so we can benchmark it. And I said, you guys can figure it out. You're as smart as we are. You know, we, can give, we give you everything you need. All you got to do is put a piece of paper and pencil together, and you can figure it out. So, um, you know, we, the pressures are there. I was, I'll tell you an interesting kind of anecdotal story was I was at the J.P. Morgan, we had a strategic meeting on uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week, and one of the guys who's on the board is a very large shareholder of J&J, &J, and he said, Bill, don't worry about the stock price. He said, because we know you guys are going to deliver it. So don't worry about it. I just keep reinvesting my dividends, tell my kids they can't sell the stock, and just keep doing what you're doing. And that's how most people do feel. So, so that's, that's really, I don't worry about the stock. Do I watch it? Sure. Do I feel bad when it's down? Yeah. Do I change anything? I do know. Yeah. You talked about uh, the switch flipping when you realize that the people that you're leading, you're actually working for those people. I was wondering if you had a, a certain experience where that switch flipped for you. And when you realize that, how has it impacted how you inspire the, uh, your, t your team? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think you're given opportunities as you advance in your career. And I don't th I'm not sure there's any one point in time that you can, you can see it. I probably felt it the most when I worked, uh, when we started up a startup company in J&J &J that was, at the time, we lost $140 million our first year, and you could worry about things. But we had 3,000 people that worked in that company, and we got it going. It's now one of J&J's biggest companies and throws off extraordinary profits. But... But um, I think at that point, I realized that we all had to work for each other, and we all had to be committed to the same objectives. And, you know, I could, you know anybody who worked in the company at that time could, could rattle off the four things that we, were, we strove to do, and we were striving to make sure we did them, um, and we beat every one of them. But it was only because nobody was more worried about themselves than they worried about what we were committed to. And I remember saying to people, you know, if... If we succeed, there'll be enough gold stars for everybody. If we don't succeed, no one gets a gold star. So we all got to get together and figure out how to get this done and do it and be as committed to each other. And that was probably the, one of the you know, watershed moments for me. We take two more questions? Sure. You guys are the boss. I'm just here. Uh, I, wanna, uh, I would like to ask about the how you <clears throat> how you manage the uh, pressure or challenges because being a you know senior manager or a big boss you have to go under like significant amount of pressure is from everywhere so that <clears throat> that uh, like how you manage the mental uh, strengths and physical strengths mm -hmm. under because you know I'm from Japan and Japanese Prime Minister just went to hospital just, yeah. uh, just after you know, <laughs> resigned. Yeah. Actually, about six months ago, I had dinner with his wife, who's a very, who's a wonderful lady. Um, how do you manage the stress? I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I really do believe I do the best I possibly can do, and I can't do any better. And if you're not happy with the job I do, find someone else who can do it better. I mean, I, I do have that attitude. I think it's really important. Um, it's not a cavalier attitude. It's just that I do the best I can. I work really hard. Um, there's a great, actually, there's a great saying downtown at Nike Town that we were, I was reading last night, and it says, um, you know, it basically says if you don't take advantage of the skills that you've been given and do the best you possibly can, shame on you, pretty much. 
So, so I do the best I can. Um, I try and be totally open and transparent with our board so they know everything that's good, bad, and ugly about what's going on in our business. Um, I, I probably, you know, physically I probably try and build time in to take care of myself, especially since I've had my knee redone. But, um, but you never find enough time. I, we were talking downstairs earlier about um, balance, you know, kind of the balance of the, the pressure probably to me is as is, is much business as it is family. And how do you figure out the right balance? And you'll never get the right balance. But I'd, I'd, I'd also recommend to every one of you to read a book called Chasing Daylight. And it's about a guy who was the CEO of uh, KPMG. He was made C, uh, CEO probably in the, his early 50s. And he had, a, he had this gnawing pain in his face like a Bell's palsy that he never got treated. And finally his wife made him go to the doctor, found out he had a terminal brain tumor and died in three months. And the book is the three months from when he was diagnosed with the tumor to the time he died. And he talks about getting things in the right perspective and priorities in your life. Um, and, and it is hard to balance that personal family and, and the business, you know, trying to climb the ladder of success. Um, and, and how do you balance those things? And it is really important that you get the right balance that you realize that you can step away from things. You know, this is, th there are moments, you know, when we, when we were negotiating some of the deals, didn't matter if um, it was somebody in my family's birthday, I wasn't going to be there. As a matter of fact, one day it was my birthday and I was sitting outside on a cell phone, everyone else was inside uh, enjoying themselves. But that, that's a fact of life. There's other times when there's really critical things in your family, where there may be important things in business going on, but they're not absolutely critical. You, you, you do those and then you try and balance them. But I, I think you just, you know, all you can do, all you can truly do is commit yourself to doing the best you can possibly do, making sure you have a group of people you can talk to that you have confidence in that will help you, you know, during tough decisions, maybe bounce them around. There's, uh, you know, you, you look at, um, I'm a firm believer that you know, if you sit in a vacuum and sit with a computer and try and make a decision by yourself, it's not going to be anywhere as near as good as if you get a group of five or six people around the table and talk things through, look at different perspectives, kind of squeeze the orange in many different ways. You'll, you'll make a better decision. Ultimately, you take the decision, you're responsible, and you're accountable, and you should hold yourself accountable for it. But you want the inputs of others, and you want to get as much information as you can. And then you've got to be at peace with it, and you've got to put it behind you. You're going to make bad decisions. You're going to make... You're going to fail in some things and you're going to make mistakes. Don't worry about it. You learn from it, take it as a valuable experience, and move on. You know, if you, if you dwell on the mistakes or the past, you're never going to be able to move on. So you learn from them, you move on, you do the best you can, and, um, and that's all you can do. I told my daughter, my daughter works at Nike. I said, uh, you know, my, my daughter, you know, is, you know, she wants, she's a career person. She's a single parent trying to conquer the world, and she worries about everything. And I, and I talked to her one night, and I said, you know, you can't worry about what happened, because it's happened. All you can do is learn from it. And you can't worry about what might happen, because you don't know if it's going to happen or not. So why worry? Just do the best you can, learn, and move forward. And that's the only advice I can really give you. And, and that does help relieve stress. Not that you get rid of it all, but it relieves some of it. And if we could invent a pill that would allow you not to sleep, <laughs> because I don't sleep well, and still feel energized, it would be different you guys a lot of success in your career, a lot of success here at school um, and in whatever you choose to do and hopefully maybe some of you will come work at J&J &J someday. So thanks again for everything. Thanks.